Good morning, everyone. Oh, I don't have to project into a microphone. Good lesson. Okay. Good morning. My name is Kara Lyons Pardue. I teach New Testament and Greek here at Point Loma. And it is my privilege to welcome you and to introduce our speaker this morning. And so welcome to the H. Orton Wiley Lecture Series sponsored by the School of Theology and Christian Ministry. We do this, if you can believe it, every year. And um, you may notice that the faculty in the School of Theology kind of sit around and love to pretend that we're back in school too. Um, And that is one of our favorite things. I want to make you aware of the next two events that are coming up tonight, or no, it's not night, it's afternoon. Um, Today, the Brood Awakening conversation will be at 3.30 in Colt Forum, Um, and so we would love for you to attend that. I believe that there's a class of students that are involved in that. Is that right? Yeah, so it won't just be a conversation among um, consummate scholars like we are, um, but instead it will include people that are on their way in their theological studies as well. Um, And then tomorrow will be our final lecture um, here again at 8.30 a.m. in Krill. This session is going to go, for those of you who are required for a class to be here, you're welcome. This is really for you. This is made to be so you can understand it. And the session will be 50 minutes long. Um, There may be time for question and answer after. So if there's something that kind of prompts you to think and you want to follow up, uh, make note of that. Uh, If you need to slip away, we encourage you not to do that. But if you need to, do so quietly and respectfully. Although I'd have to say it's kind of hard to see from here, so I I don't know if he'll notice. Um, uh, But I will. I'll notice. Okay. Um, And so I want to introduce to you Dr. Brian Bantam. Um, His study is at the intersection of race, of identity, of, and theology. He's the Associate Professor of Theology at Seattle Pacific University. And I have to say that I was introduced to one of his articles quite early, and I think we could probably say he was um, woke before that became a broader thing, okay? He's been having nuanced conversations about race and really engaging this question theologically for a long time. Um, He has written several works that you can see in this brochure if you'll look at it. And um, the overall lecture series that he's gifted us with here is who will we be doing theology as though our bodies mattered? Uh, The title of this specific lecture is God With Us, the body that saves, would you join me in a hearty welcome of Dr. Brian Bantam. Good morning, y'all. Wow, there's a lot of you here this morning. I didn't want to look backwards because I didn't want to see like an empty hall because of people who didn't want to be here at 9.30 in the morning. But um, it's good to have you all here and thank you so much for that kind introduction. I should have it on a business card. I was woke while you were all asleep. Um, if only that were, that were true. Um, so this morning, we finally get to Jesus. Uh, we have spent the last uh, two lectures talking a little bit about the significance of the body, about what it means to do theology as though our bodies mattered. Um, what does it mean to say that God, in God's life, is difference and likeness and movement? And to say that to be made in the image of God is to mean that our bodies are bound up, are like one another, um, of the same stuff, and yet at the same time, we are fundamentally different than one another. And so our image and likeness to God has as much to do with our movement towards one another and towards God and towards the ground as it has to do with any quality or characteristic. And at the same time, we also wanted to talk about this idea that our body lives are lives that are contingent, that are bound up in ways that are fallen. And that this fallenness isn't a matter, simply a matter of a mark that is against us, a kind of defilement, a a, a disobedience that makes us kind of against God. But it is actually um, that those qualities of likeness, our flesh and our spirit, our relationality, our freedom, are now oriented not towards one another in such a way that we are bone of bone and flesh of flesh, but now away from one another in such a way that I can only establish who I am and who we are over and against violently differentiating the other. And this is the state that we exist in. And so now the question is, what will God do? 
How does God save us in this way? And so we exist now in a state of fallen life. And by fallen life, I mean conditions that shape our lives together. Sin is not only my desires that are bent towards myself, my envy, my lust, my greed, um, the, the abuse of my body or the, the abuse of others. Sin is also social. It shapes the way that we imagine who we are and who we believe we ought to be. Racism, sexism are not only matters of personal hatred or distress. It's not a personal problem. It's not that one individual person dislikes another. We are shaped by worlds, by language, by practices that are stained by violent differentiations that allow us to rationalize away our own sins while we demand that others pay with their lives. The racism, the sexism are about ways that certain bodies are created, how bodies are reduced to particular characteristics, how housing, education, and economic policy all build upon one another, pressing back some bodies while accelerating others, even in their stunning mediocrity or incompetence. But to paint the world as one of utter violence would also not tell the whole story. In this world, we also see joy. We see communities that hold one another together, that speak humanity into one another's lives and allow us to see glimpses of what it means to be seen and to see others. And so if we take a moment to consider the black church, for example, from its inception in the hush harbors of the South to the earliest preachers in the North, in the words of scripture, they saw life even when their enslavers meant these words to justify their bodies being enslaved. They saw liberation. In their lives, they, with one another, they sung songs that were multivocal, that could speak of despair and loss and hope and God's presence. They could imagine a world where there is no pain, and they could also make, plain, make plans to make that world possible. And so to do theology as if our bodies mattered, um, is to resist the simple reductions of our lives to saints or to sinners, to victims or oppressors, to tragedy or victory. In my life, I am always holding these things together, navigating, resisting, yearning from moment to moment. And yet, at the same time, I am confronting, learning, delving into my own history, into our histories together to discover the work that my body does in the world, the work that it might do in the world. And so the journey of discovering the significance of our body lives, in part, is what it means to be part of Israel's life. That in Israel, we see a people whose lives were, were with God, we're constantly circulating around the mundane things, around food, about who's in, about who's out, around a life without the land, to strangeness of being in the land and not knowing what to do. It was a life of passing on language and being without language. It was a life constituted constantly by God's decision to be for them to be um, with them. God's decision for them, I will be your God and you, I, you will be my people. And in Israel's life, we see the continuation of a song, of a current, of a movement of God's life and decision to be with us. That God does not abide in the world in abstraction, but through presence, through particularity. Yes, God holds all of creation willing it to be, but God also abides in that creation by sharing God's self with these creatures. God abides with these creatures, but out of humanity makes a particular people, combine, com, combining promise and particularity, of combining the, the particularity in the presence of Abram and Sarah. He takes these two, I almost say grains of sand, much like the very first moment of creation, and breathes a promise into them and molds a people. God reverberates in creation through these people through this point of contact, through these bodies of a people. And then from these people, from this presence, from this song God sings into creation, God calls upon a young woman. And in her reception, in her yes, God comes near. The song rings now from within us. The word becomes flesh. God takes on garments of our skin and is enfleshed in our existence, our need, our struggle, our not knowing. 
God is immersed in the systems of language and culture and value and joy. And here I want to make a kind of slight distinction and, and talk a little bit about why I chose the word bodies over and over and over again. So on the one hand, yes, I mean the kind of the, the tactile material realities of our lives. Uh, but there's actually a kind of critical distinction in, in critical theory and culture between flesh and body. Some theorists such as Michel Foucault or um, Hortense Spillers want to make a distinction between flesh and body. What they say is that body is in fact a construction. That really what we are is flesh. We are these things, this material world that, that has in a sense no fundamental meaning. But the notion of a body is the way in which meaning is laid upon these, this flesh. The way that we somehow become, certain bodies become ugly or beautiful or ideal or consummate of what it means to be citizenship. A citizen, smart, intelligent, funny, dumb, competent, incompetent. These, this is what a body means. It is the meaning that gets layered on top of the flesh. And so for them, they want to kind of pull away from this language of body because it, it implies always the power of who gets to name the body. But I want to suggest that actually the language of bodies matters because when we think about the word in flesh, the word enters into this dynamic of having to be named. Of having to, of his, of his body doing a certain kind of work in the world. And if we ignore those dynamics of power, we actually ignore the very salvific realities that are become possible in the word made flesh. And so as African American theologian Howard Thurman reminds us, um, Jesus becomes not just a man, a man in general, a human being in the universal sense of the word, but he becomes the child of a dispossessed people. He calls this the idea of Jesus and the disinherited, a people whose lives were subject to empire and loss. The bodied word is subject not only to our human limitations, but is subject to a system where his body is read, where it does work. He is not simply a human being in an abstract sense, but he speaks language. He loves certain food. He hears the laughter and tears of his people. His maleness, his Jewishness, his, his poverty, his dispossession are all part of his story. And so in many ways, there's an early theologian, Irenaeus of Lyon, who says, who talks about this idea of the significance of Mary, and he says, and he's trying to make this case about the significance of, of Jesus' real humanity. And he talks about Mary, and he says, would the word come into Mary if he were to receive nothing from her? I love that, I love that phrase. But in addition to that, I ask myself oftentimes, well, what, what, why Mary? Is she just a vessel? But in fact, I, perhaps it is, it is the fact that when the word becomes flesh, the word says, look, Mary, from you I want to learn what it means to be a human being. I want to follow you as a little two-year-old and see the things that outrage, that out give you rage. I want to see the things that cry, make your heart cry out. I want to learn how to pray from you, Mary. It's from you that I need to learn how to be a human being. So in the very Annunciation of the child, we see the significance of Jesus' life for Mary. She did not cry out, my soul is saved. What did she say? The hungry will be fed. The rich will be brought low. Sounds awfully political, doesn't it? But in her conception of Jesus and her prophetic declarations, we also see God infusing redemption into the very structures of gender, of ethnicity. Early church theologian Irenaeus, all right, I've talked about that part. Um, he talks about this idea of the recapitulation of Adam and Eve and Mary and Jesus. Um, that in the incarnation, God begins to undo the fragmentation of God in us, and that becoming like us, we become like God. We become sons and daughters. And what Irenaeus is pointing to here is not simply a system of sacrifice, but he is suggesting that something happens in the incarnation, that in the shape and movement of God's life into us, as something, that something is communicated to us, breathed into our ways of life, into our relationships, that which God assumes God saves. This is not only a statement of Jesus' nature as human and divine, but it is about the shape and measure of the life he lives. 
As he lives, he is immersed more and more completely into the waters of our humanity, experiencing our lives, our condition of being human. And as he does so, he takes it into his body and makes it into something new. The word becomes flesh and becomes a bodied life that saves us not in his dying, but in his living. As he moves through his life, he certainly preaches. He calls us into a deeper understanding of Jewish law and the promises that they point to. But he embodies the law. He is the law. He lives the law, even into its most confounding and paradoxical ends. He enters the home of the tax collector into the centurion. He calls everyone from fishermen to doctors to wives to widows and to, to become part of a new family, a new people bound to a willing. Who are my brothers and my sisters but those who do the will of my father? This life enters not only into our most personal moments of isolation and fear, but into the political and systematic, systemic modulations of our unfaithfulness. Perhaps this is seen most clearly in Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well. In this encounter, Jesus meets a woman who has been through so much, is clearly alone, trying to make it the best she can. And yet her life has been subjected to the social exclusion of the Samaritans from Jews, from the men who have divorced her over and over again, to the women in her community who shun her until she is left in the heat of the day to fetch water on her own. And in this moment, Jesus approaches and transgresses every single one of these systemic structural lines of differentiation, Jew and Samaritan, man and woman, holy and unholy. In the mere talking, the encounter, before Jesus has even said a word, he has not simply redeemed this woman, but he has communicated something to the very law, the very structure, the very social imagination that allowed this woman that rendered her alone in the first place. With every step of his life, he presses the fullness of his love and life in the reciprocity of love and mutuality that is God's life is breathed again into our decaying lives and into our fragmenting social systems. If we are serious when, that when we say that this person is God, then what he assumes he saves, the conditions of being human, he enters into, he participates with, he receives, and we receive something from him and he reverberates into the world through these points of contact drawing the entirety of our lives into God's song. He tells us from, that from what moment on can a woman and a man no longer sit side by side? Who can say that they are the, a self-made man? Who can say that citizenship is something that can be claimed over and against the humanity and the flourishing of another? Jesus' life is the revelation of God's song, of the current of who God is. These reverberations of love permeating our lives and revealing to us once again what it means to be made in the image of God. But even more, knitting this presence into our lives until he has followed us even into the, the corners of betrayal and isolation, where he prays for his followers, he prays for us, and what is it that he says to God? Let them be in me the way that I am in you, God. Let them be daughters and sons. Let them participate, bend, dance, sing, eat, laugh, pray, yearn, hope with me as I have lived and loved you. And then he continues to follow us. He follows us into torture into becoming a pawn for political gain, into then finally the very fragmentation of our bodies and our souls. In taking the cross upon his back, his isolation is not only of being without friends, but becoming that, that moment in society where the entirety of our blame and our misalignment are redistributed upon him. <clears throat> 
As Adam lays his guilt upon Eve and as Eve lays her guilt upon the snake, each more deeply fragmenting themselves from one another, so too the Roman guards, the Pharisees, and the shouting crowds lay their guilt upon Jesus, leaving him to heave the sins of his people beyond the gate into the wilderness. It is within this arc of Jesus' immersion into human life and the suffering of our various attempts to imagine ourselves apart from God that we must consider Jesus' death, within Jesus' death as part of a fuller identification with what it means to be human. Jesus does not point to the guilty and say, it was not me, right? If anyone could be in that moment, say, God, it wasn't me, it was them. He had that option. He could do it. He alone, right, was the one who could adjudicate between who was good and who was evil. But he doesn't do that, right? He allows himself to be hoisted upon the cross. And in doing so, what does he do? He says, I am not me without you. You are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Yes, Jesus dies for our sins, takes the punishment that we deserve. But even more, in the crucifixion, we see, Jesus's, we see Jesus immersing himself deeply into the pain and fear and isolation of an identity without God of a personhood stripped of its fundamental relationality, of its freedom, of its utter subjugation to the power and violent misperceptions of individuals and institutions alike. Punishment is too transactional of a term even for what it is that God does, suggesting that we somehow had a mark upon us that needed to be cleaned, and that was all there was to it. The difficulty of the fallen human condition was far more grievous than this. Jesus' cry in his last breath shows us this, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' God forsakenness frames Jesus' death as the culminating moment of the communication of idioms, my favorite term. It's, a, it's actually a communicatio idiomatum. It sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Communicatio idiomatum. But what it means is that as God becomes like us, we become like God. That the attributes, the idioms, the qualities that constitute and permeate God's life, when the word becomes flesh, those characteristics are communicated to us. Much like a heat communicates heat to, a, to iron put in, the, in a furnace. That this, this iron draws in the heat and movement. And so when you pull it out, it's, it's, it's red. From, the, the, from holding on these qualities of heat. In a sense, this is God's immersion of God's life into us, communicating something to us, to people who have become grown cold and rigid and alone. So in his crucifixion, Jesus identifies with and is present with us even into the condition which is farthest from him. Creatures whose identities have become enraptured in their distance from God, in their individuality, in their own power, in their own certainty, mistaking their death for life. And so as the centurion, centurions hear the veil tear, they exclaim, surely this was the Son of God. And in the words coming so radically near to death, entering into its very depth, God reveals that there is nothing that is too far from God that there is no condition that cannot be touched. And of course, we can only speak of this now because we are on the other side of the resurrection. We know that Jesus' death was not the final moment of his identification with humanity. But we say, by his stripes we are healed. And by this, we mean to say that he enters into our afflictions of our separation, taking them upon himself, he heals by being wounded. He became sin, quote unquote, is to say that he identifies with our refusal of God so thoroughly that his identity becomes bound even to what is fundamentally opposed to him. In his death, in, in his death he takes even the separation of body and soul into his identity. Now here, I just want to take a step back again to say that this idea, he becomes sin, is an, is only, if we understand this as a mark, as a kind of quality, as a characteristic, we lose the sensibility of what it is that's happening here. 
When we say that he becomes sin, he enters into a moment, a current, a dynamic of life that is fundamentally death-dealing. He enters into systems that constantly chip away at our humanity, turning us into pawns, into things to be consumed, into bodies that simply get deployed and redeployed so that another might be fed. He becomes sin is to say that he is immersed into the social systems of being human that somehow have made us less like God. And so as he takes the separation of body and soul into his life and identity, we can now say that Jesus is all, will always be the one who died. That Jesus is the body that saves not because of his sacrificial life, of, of his sacrificial death, but he saves because of a life that it pursued us even into our own deaths. It is in this participatory sense, in this sense of presence, that we begin to understand the language of justification more fully, right? It's not you are justified. It is to say that we live into being made right, being at one with again. Justification within this frame points to an aligning, a straightening of relationship where, what, where that which was crooked, pointed away, moving away from God, comes again into proper proximity, becomes oriented, has a trajectory restored back towards God and restored to one another. But even here, justification takes on an even more radical sense because in Jesus' life, the alignment is not simply a restoration of Adam and Eve's prior state. In Christ, partaking in death, the lines that are made straight are then exploded within Christ's body, poured out into the resurrection, such that I am born again a new creature. When Jesus emerges from the, res from the tomb in that moment of resurrection, in the, in, the, in the language of the Eastern Orthodox, the tomb becomes a womb. In the same way that he immerses his life into our lives, taking every aspect of our condition into his own life, in the resurrection he emerges healed, made new, the one who died and yet lives, and in his body we are present. We are with him. We are reborn, and not simply those who say they are Christian, but now everyone who shares his body, every human being that ever was, every human being that ever will be, emerges from that tomb. And so we can truly say what can separate us from the life of Christ. And who will we be in the face of this one who has taken our life into his, become bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh? Who has sung a new life into the sinews of our lives together and then invited us to sing a new song? What if we cannot trace this salvation in a progression of beliefs or a compendium of laws, but all, the only way is to enter into is to see the difference in our midst and bend our ears to the ways that God has already come near? What if salvation is not a place, but a way? Thank you.